want to welcome you this evening to our town hall meeting on the old Newgate prison in Copper Mine. I'm Tammy Zawistowski, State Representative for the 61st District, which represents East Granby, Suffield, and the portion of Windsor that's closest to East Granby, which is the northern part of Waconic and Rainbow. Uh, there's two main reasons I think it's really important to have this meeting tonight. Uh, the first one is that I think the, I think the community needs to know what's going on up at Old Newgate. It's been closed for a while, and now signs of activity are starting to come out. Oh, it, it's great. I was talking before. Um, I get calls and emails. Um, do people have seen trucks going up and down Newgate? And it's the first time I've ever had people calling about trucks and actually happy about them. <laughs> okay. um, anyway, that's to keep the community informed. I also think it's important to have the people that are working on Newgate and are actively involved know what the community has in mind as well, what, what the community expects. And I think keeping the community engaged, whether it's the East Granby community or the historical community as a whole, is going to be really important for the success of Newgate going forward. Um, you know, there has been input that we've gotten over over the past months when we've, since this, we've opened a dialogue on it. And we've had ideas like, let's bring back the Halloween open house, I mean, the Halloween haunted house. Uh, we've had things, hey, how about Beats Tavern? What's going on with that? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to have maybe weddings up there? And wouldn't it look really good if we got the Historical Society coach up there at the same time? Um, and other things that I finally find personally interesting, which would be um, maybe coordinating with other activities in town. We had the uh, Revolutionary War encampment uh, last year, two years ago now. And um, to coordinate that kind of activity, to just create synergies to get people involved in history and also in East Granby. And my personal favorite, I think it would be really good to have a new gate working with the schools. Uh, I think it would be a, a very, very positive thing for, for both the schools and for, for Newgate. Uh, anyway, we just, we're, it's not going to be a night of, of speeches from us. We're going to hear from the people that are directly involved. Um, but for a couple of minutes here, I just want to, um, to uh, our co-hosts, I want to just give them an opportunity to speak a few minutes. Uh, we have Senator John Kissel and uh, State Representative Bill Szymanski. I'll invite John Kissel up here right now. Thanks, Tammy. I'll be mercifully brief. First of all, now I know why they call today Fat Tuesday, because I'm feeling like <laughs> uh, fat on. Uh, but Dan's going to do a wonderful job doing the presentation. We've had several meetings on Newgate over the last few years, seeing it come to fruition. Bill's been fabulous uh, prior to when Tammy was elected in her own right. Congratulations. Uh, and so this has been sort of fits and starts, but I think that we're rounding an important corner right now. So not only is this tremendous for all the folks in East Granby, but this is a real asset for North Central Connecticut. And I feel like the time is getting very exciting uh, when they're beginning to do some work in the hard, freezing winter months to lay the groundwork for what they're going to be able to do as soon as spring gets here and it can't get here any sooner if you ask me. So thank you, Tammy, for uh, putting this all together. Happy to co-host it with you. And Bill, represents Nancy. I'll sit down. I'm pretty excited about Old Newgate, because uh, when I first moved to Connecticut in 1987, one of the first things I did with my wife and my two young boys was take them on a tour to prison. And we still have one of those iron keys that they made back at the time, and we have a lithograph of the of the prison in our in our rooms. So it was special to me. It was something my first introduction to Connecticut. Then when I became a representative, I actually represented the East Granby before Tammy got involved in Newgate. And I'm really excited now to continue the trend of being involved in Newgate, because many of you remember Rich Ferrari. And every time I run into Rich, he says, what's going on at Newgate? And I tell him, this is what's happening. Some kind of, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Well, it's, it's actually happening. Things are occurring at the old Newgate, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm glad you're here to hear about the progress that's being made. Thank you. Now, I just want to give you a little bit of background on the two people. Actually, um, first selectman Jim Hayden walked in. I offered him the opportunity to say a few words. You want to, but before we start the meat of the, the presentation, you want to come up here, Jim? <coughs> a perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> there you go. Good evening and welcome. My apologies for being uh, a little late. 
Uh, but once you hear the reason, you'll understand uh, that perhaps it's a good reason. There's another committee uh, meeting that I attended at 5 o'clock that just got over that is uh, doing the 50th anniversary celebration of Vietnam and Vietnam vets. And it's going to be at the Air Museum and at the Air National Guard. Expect eight to 10,000 people each day, July 10th, I'm sorry, July 11th and July 12th. Uh, so there's going to be a really large activity, but I think it puts the spotlight on the Vietnam veterans, and I think it's well deserved and well suited. So anyway, so my apologies for being late. Uh, a quick segue over to Old Newgate, and nobody's happier than I am to to, uh, to find out that we'll be able to take the top sign down that says closed uh, and after five years, and, and so that's terrific. So again, my apologies for being late, and thank you, Tammy, for allowing me just a minute to start the preamble of some really good stuff that's going to be happening here in East Granby uh, and Windsor Locks in July. And welcome and thank you for coming. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to move this cord before somebody hurts themselves. Um, anyway, I uh, wanted to give you some background on the two people that are going to be doing the bulk of the presentation tonight. Um, first one, Daniel Forrest is the, uh, Dan Forrest, uh, is the Director of Art and Historic Preservation in the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, he's been a professional archaeologist for 17 years, more than 17 years actually, conducted over 60 archaeological surveys and excavations in every part of the state. Before he took the director's position as DECD, he worked closely with the staff of the Connecticut Office of the Arts to improve the granting process and to identify means of improving services for the constituents in Connecticut. As a director, Dan is responsible for four historic state prisons, the Henry Whitefield House in Guilford, the Eric Sloan Museum in Kent, the Prudence Crandall Museum in Canterbury, and here Old Newgate Prison in East Granby. And he's assisted by museum director of Karen Peterson, who's also here tonight, who has some, some fascinating stories. She's, been, she's been, spent a lot of time here. Um, she's worked for the Historic Preservation Office since 2001, and 15 years before that for the uh, Antiquarian Landmark Society, including up at the Phelps Hathaway House in Suffield. Um, she's also been involved in the George Reed House in Delaware, the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion in Philadelphia, Historic Annapolis, and several other places. Um, I, I hope that um, you, are, you are very um, free to ask a lot of questions and everything else. They're here to answer questions as well as make a presentation. And I really appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, and I wanted to thank you all for coming out and braving the cold. It's been a harsh winter all around. Uh, we'll talk a little bit on the impact that's had on our construction. Um, but I want to let you know I have a couple of goals uh, for this evening. Uh, first and foremost, we want to give you an update on the progress we're making uh, for the rehabilitation, particularly for the guardhouse at Old Newgate. Um, but also for, to give you a much better understanding of the decisions we've made and why we've gone in the direction we've gone. Uh, that has everything to do with the particular um, characteristics of Old Newgate and the guardhouse itself, which have provided some specific challenges for us, but also some fantastic opportunities uh, going forward. Uh, so with that, so uh, yeah, my apologies here. Uh, can you all hear me without this? Or yeah, here, let me see if I can. Uh, first, I wanted to give you a quick summary. It has not been quiet, although it certainly seems dormant out at that site on a frequent enough basis. Uh, but DECD has moved forward, and prior to that, the Commission on Culture and Tourism and a lot of important structural repairs throughout the property, not just within the prison yard, uh, but for a number of the adjacent properties. Uh, these are just a couple of those highlights. Uh, we completed major structural repairs to Veek's Tavern. Uh, that's on the interior and included major bracing, cable bracing for the entire roof system, which was uh, seriously challenged uh, at the time. We've also done a lot of structural bracing for the barns at Beats to make sure that those continue to stand. Uh, new roof and carpenter repairs uh, at the guardhouse itself, as well as new roof and major structural repairs at the adjacent property of Montana and Newgate Road. We want to highlight, this was actually the project we were leading up to, uh, we are hoping was going to be the great unveiling for our opening. Uh, in 2012, 
uh, DECD completed a brand new mine lighting system. Uh, for those of you, and I think that's just about everybody in the room, who are familiar with the property. Many of you probably remember the old lighting system. Um, this, that lighting system had failed uh, consistently and was actually a huge safety hazard. Uh, the lights were not actually designed for wet environments, and so they were continually shorting out. Uh, we had huge rust problems, and we had a lot of cabling that was so far out of code, uh, we couldn't have an electrician touch it. Uh, so we're very proud of the new lighting system, um, and we're looking forward to unveiling this uh, to the broad public. Uh, this system was really designed to be durable, uh, survive the uh, constantly wet conditions in there. It's an all-LED system. It's designed to try to retain the character of the mine, uh, so the ambient light levels are actually quite low, surprisingly low, I think many of you will find. Uh, but there's a lot of feature lighting uh, within the mine itself to really draw all the visitors' attentions to the main highlights within the, uh, within the mine. And so this, I know it's a little bit hard to see this, but this gives you a sense there's lots of under rail lighting right now, so there are safe conditions, everyone can see their footing, uh, but it doesn't flood the entire mine itself with light, so you don't lose the sense of what it was like to experience this, either as a prisoner or as a miner. It was, that was very important to us in the planning. <coughs> And the big reason we're here today is to talk about the dark house um, and why exactly we've been focusing so much attention on this. Uh, so this is just to get you oriented. Um, many of you are, are quite familiar with the property. Uh, the guardhouse, particularly the west end where that red arrow is pointing, is the primary challenge we're facing right now. Uh, this is the only intact standing structure within the prison yard. Uh, it's very important for a number of reasons, but in particular, this is one of our primary areas for doing interpretive exhibits. And so it's important for us to retain this. And most importantly, at, outside of the mine itself, the jug cells in the basement of the structure are some of the most evocative um, features that we have on the property itself. It's, it, these make an enormous impression, and they're still intact. Um, and there's also very important archaeological deposits that have yet to be excavated in the basement and below the floor slabs in this property, in this building. So what is the issue? Um, there's a very long-standing structural problem uh, with the guardhouse, and in particular the west side of it. Uh, it was originally built over uh, mine tailings. So it was constructed originally to control the entrance in and out of the mine and make sure that the prisoners stayed where they were supposed to be. Um, it was expanded, there was an addition built on the west end, and that west end was built on a steep slope. And so when they constructed this, they did it frankly on the cheap. Um, and they used a lot of mine tailings, all the debris from the mine itself, piled it up and made a fairly level surface and then just put, uh, built what passes for the foundation for that part of the building on top of those loose, uh, loose materials. Uh, and that building has actually been settling, very likely from shortly after it was originally constructed. And there's lots and lots of evidence of that <coughs> movement. So again, this is a little bit hard to see. That white line is to give you a visual reference for what a level plane is um, and what the building looks like today. So on the right side of the screen, uh, you'll see the west end and you'll see the variation of the brick. The darker brick on the right side of the screen is the part that was reconstructed by the state in 1976. Uh, that reconstruction was actually built on top of the sagging foundation. So if you look carefully, you'll see the courses of the brick are actually, they added quite a few extra bricks in order to bring it up to level. Uh, so the new structure was roughly uh, plumb and square when it was built. Uh, but in order to do that, they had to do all kinds of chinking. So the arrow near the middle of the screen pointing shows you a course of uh, brick wedges that were actually inserted between the two foundation sections. So even by 1976, uh, the foundation had already moved over four inches from where it should have been. Um, they built a fairly square building on top of it. A couple of other things I want to point out about this structure. The brick that you see, it's not a full, um, full depth brick wall. This is a single course of brick that's actually a visual veneer. Inside, it's a wood framed structure. And by far the worst section, where the movement is most aggressive, is in the southwest corner of the building. Uh, again, the lighting isn't great here, but where you see that 1976 label, uh, that is where brick was actually inserted in a section of the foundation that had already cracked and separated from the rest of the stone masonry. Um, and again, these gaps are, in 1976, those gaps were two to three inches. Um, in some cases, pushing four inches, uh, where they sort of repaired it. But you can see they never did anything um, in the 70s to actually shore it up. Uh, they simply accommodated the structure itself that they built on top of it. And it was relatively stable. However, you see this uh, lighter line 
in the brickwork where the 2009 plus label is. That's where the agency has been doing repointing. That's evidence that the actual superstructure above it, the brick, is actually continuing to move and separate from the rest of it. Um, this has gotten bad enough that the building itself is now structurally unsound. Um, it's unsafe. Uh, nobody goes in or out of it unless uh, there's, you know, they have a very specific reason to be there. And for those of you who uh, know Lance, who's the dedicated staff member, his office was in this part of the building until we got him out of there. Uh, so th there's lots of reasons to be concerned about it. But even just as a, again, as a visual reference, you can see this, this building has been moving for a long time, and it's moving at an accelerating rate right now. So why is this happening? As I mentioned, the building was constructed on fairly loose materials. In all of my career as a historic preservationist, as an archaeologist, I have never seen a building of this scale built in this fashion. So what you can see here is that in the uh, background of the screen, you see the large stone blocks which are visible from the exterior here. Uh, this is the west wall of the guardhouse. And you can see those huge gaps uh, already between the stones. To the left is that southwest corner, which is sinking and moving away from the rest of the building. Those gaps, are, uh, those gaps are, have been widening. Um, in fact, they've more than doubled in size over the last two years. Um, so it's moving rapidly. What is very difficult to see in this lighting is immediately below that is all of this loose rubble material. Those large stone blocks that you see are sitting directly on top of that loose rubble. There is, in essence, no foundation under this part of the building at all. Um, this material, when we excavated it, was loose enough you could pull everything out with your hands. There was no actual digging. It was mostly moving loose material out. And immediately below this, are voids between the stones that are directly supporting this building that are large enough to stick your arm, in some cases your leg, through. Um, so it's a very unstable situation. These large stones where they actually uh, lay on top of each other and in physical contact with each other would be relatively stable. Not what you'd want to build on, but not as alarming as what we're seeing here. Uh, in essence, all of these stones can move independently of each other, uh, which is the last thing you want for a building foundation system. All right, so there is no laid stone beneath uh, this part portion of the, visit, uh, the building. Uh, what you see on the exterior is, in essence, the actual structure uh, that is supporting the entire building. Um, as you all know, in New England, we get lots of frosting. Uh, we get lots of freezing and thawing. That always causes motion. But if you don't have a foundation that ex at least extends below the frost line, that moves a lot faster. Um, so all that stone, stone debris is really loose. It's separated by all sorts of uh, fine sands and gravels. So this situation is not new, as I've said, and the state had made a significant effort to fix this uh, problem back in 1999 and 2000. Uh, so what the state had done is actually excavated the entire perimeter of this portion of the guardhouse um, to pour concrete all the way around uh, what passed for the foundation, uh, with the idea that it would hold all of that loose material together and um, shore the building up. Uh, this repair was unsuccessful, in essence, because that concrete is sinking essentially at the same rate as the building itself. Um, so everything is moving um, as a piece now. So what are the challenges? What is the figurative and the literal balancing act uh, that we're trying to pull off here? Um, first, Old Newgate Prison is both a National Historic Landmark, which is the absolute highest status the federal government recognizes for historical significance. Uh, this is one of 62 National Historic Landmark properties in the state of Connecticut. Uh, it is also a state archaeological preserve, and it is an archaeological preserve uh, because of the unique aspects of the archaeological deposits here. Uh, those deposits are likely the very best source of new information about the mine, the prison, um, and in particular the people who uh, worked and were incarcerated at the property. Um, we have fairly extensive documentary records. Um, some of you are familiar with the history of the property and have seen some of the prisoners' accounts um, and other histories of it. The archaeology brings an entire different perspective to this. It is essentially a way to fact check all of those historic narratives and understand how people were actually living and doing their business um, here at the property. Uh, so we need to be mindful about any repairs or reconstruction on the property that destroys that archaeological record because it's our best chance of learning something new and shedding light on our own history. The other, one of the other issues is the long-term stabilization of the guardhouse requires a, so, a sound foundation system. And given the instability of the sediments on this slope, 
and the very steep slope underlying this, uh, both in the bedrock and the till, we needed to have a system that actually um, was firmly attached to something stable so we weren't patching, we weren't band putting a band-aid over the situation again. So the commitment we made and the charge we gave to our engineers was to design a system. We don't talk about permanent repairs, but we gave them a 100-year time horizon uh, to design to. So we have confidence at the end of the day that this system is going to keep that building uh, standing with reasonable maintenance uh, for another century. So arresting the movement of building requires that the entire superstructure, so we're not dismantling this building. Uh, this, man, this building has to stay where it is while we build an entire new foundation system directly underneath it. Uh, so it needs to be temporarily supported, essentially suspended, um, so to allow excavation directly underneath it. Uh, the building itself is unstable, so we're not dealing with a building that wants to stay upright at this point. Um, it's far enough off plumb it would like to collapse if given the opportunity, which makes the construction much more delicate than it would be otherwise. And finally, the easy solutions. Some of the first options that we were offered by the engineers um, are not appropriate for this particular circumstance because of the archaeological sensitivity here. So one of the options we were given was uh, to do high pressure grout injection directly underneath the building. Uh, so in essence, what they would do is um, using piping, they would inject uh, a flowing concrete, in essence, uh, to consolidate and create an entire slab under the existing building, and then that slab itself would be supported by pilings. In doing that, you entomb and permanently destroy all of the archaeological materials uh, that are directly underneath this, and in particular in the jug cells, where we have the best chance of actually finding artifacts that are directly associated with the prisoners themselves. All right, and the other thing is, it's not just the materials directly below the guardhouse that are unstable. The entire hillside uh, behind this building is moving. And we know that's moving. If those of you are familiar, you know there's a large uh, stone retaining wall below the guardhouse. Uh, that retaining wall itself is moving quite rapidly. Um, it's deflected more than a foot, and itself was on the verge of collapse. Uh, were that to collapse, the entire hillside above it and likely the guardhouse with it at real risk of uh, coming down. So uh, the problem is any heavy machinery that we would get to work on the guardhouse itself has to park directly above this retaining wall. Uh, so it's a very precarious situation. What you see in the image on the right is all the temporary shoring, uh, which we've installed to uh, keep that retaining wall intact uh, throughout the construction period. But we still have major constraints on the size of equipment that we can use. Um, how heavy it is, and how much vibration they can introduce without uh, running the risk of that wall giving way. And just to the left of this uh, is the actual prison wall, the perimeter wall itself. And we don't want to do anything that's going to risk any damage to that itself. Uh, that is perhaps one of the most uh, character-defining features of the entire property. So what is the plan? Um, we've done targeted archaeological excavations just in the areas that are going to be physically disturbed during the construction, those that haven't already been mucked around with, uh, to try, try to recover important information. Uh, the next phase is to drill micro piles. These are very thin, um, in essence, uh, small diameter uh, tubes that are filled with a very um, strong concrete-like material that extends the physical structure all the way down to the bedrock below the building. Uh, so in many areas, this is a depth of 18 feet uh, below the building itself. Um, everything above that is either unstable or questionable. Um, so in essence, we are building a stilt system. You can think of it as under this building. So even if the hillside moves, this building will stay where it is uh, right now. And then we need to also install temporary beams around the entire perimeter of this portion of the building uh, that are actually going to support it while everything underneath it is removed. Right, so the building is essentially going to be suspended in air um, on, a number, on a series of what are called needle beams, uh, small diameter needle beams, and um, I -beams, steel I beams are going to be uh, bracketed all the way around the wall in order to keep everything in place. The other thing to keep in mind about this type of structure, unlike modern construction where there's a concrete foundation, uh, where everything is a single unit and you can take a little piece, you can dig out underneath one section and not worry about it falling in. These are all individual stone blocks. If you dig under one of them, that stone block falls. Um, and everything associated that it's also supporting you know, also falls. So we need to have a continuous system of support that's going to suspend the building itself. 
Finally, uh, the most important piece of this is after those micropiles are done, uh, the ends of it are just going to be below the surface, below the building. We're going to pour an entire new, what's called a gray beam, a very large uh, piece of concrete, but one that is actually directly supported by those pylons extended to bedrock. And then a new foundation of the same stone is going to be reconstructed to support the building. Uh, those needle beams will be removed and everything will be patched. Uh, so the goal here is that the building itself does not move. It doesn't move an inch uh, any further. And at the end of the day, um, all of these pieces go back together and the building will be um, stable for um, a long period into the future. So who's the team? Um, the names you see in white are the um, consultants and contractors who work directly for DECD. Um, most important of these is probably uh, BH plus A, the Markman, Hendry, and Archetype uh, out of Boston. Jack Lassman uh, is the lead architect on the um, project and has taken the lead in designing this along with the engineers. Um, from GEI Consultants and Structures North, uh, John Watney. And in the lower right, or the middle right, you'll see uh, Ross Harper. Uh, Dr. Harper is with Archaeological and Historical Services out of Stores. Uh, they're the firm who's done all the archaeology to date. Uh, they have some more work to be done once we temporarily stabilize the building. Uh, there'll be some excavations on the interior uh, for the areas that are going to be disturbed during the actual uh, grade being construction. And then the names in uh, yellow are those, uh, those who were awarded the construction contract through a bidding process. Uh, so that's uh, GL Capasso, uh, Carmine Capasso represents them, and David Chapman, uh, Jim Cook, and Kevin White from Blakesley, Ohio, and Chapman Incorporated. They are the engineers uh, for the general contractor. All of these folks are working very carefully to make sure that all of the constraints that we just talked about are addressed very carefully, as well as the new situations we're encountering. Uh, for those of you who may own historic homes, um, you know any kind of construction project <coughs> comes with contingencies. Uh, this project is like that, um, ramped up um, by a factor of 10. Uh, every little change introduces new complexities that we're working through. So what progress have we made? Um, as I mentioned before, we've done archaeological excavations. So everywhere where there's a temporary footing, everywhere where there needs to be major excavation, the archaeologists have gone in, um, done work themselves to recover artifacts and identify any deposits. They may be able to tell us um, some new aspect of the story of the people who lived and worked here. Um, so these are just a couple of the highlights for the archaeological findings. Uh, what you see on the top is an iron fork. Uh, this is very likely a, a typical type of utensil that was used above ground, not likely uh, comparable uh, in the mine itself. Uh, on the bottom, actually a Vermont coin. This is an 18th century coin. Um, I don't have the specific date on this, but we're uh, looking forward to seeing the full analysis of it. So that's a, a copper or cuprous um, coin itself. And then a small selection of some of the other materials. In the upper left is a kaolin uh, tobacco pipe uh, bowl. Uh, that size and that form is very typical for um, early to mid 19th century. On the right are two buttons, uh, likely from uh, clothing worn by either prisoners or the uh, folks working there. The center is a Dunflint. Uh, the lower left is a um, Strikolite. So this would have been used uh, on a piece of steel in order to um, start fires. And on the top, uh, what you see is the back of a button. That's the iron back of a button. Again, a personal ornamentation. Um, by far, the superstar artifact uh, that was recovered, and I think this one, again, uh, Newgate itself is a very evocative property. It's always an experience when you go there. Archaeologists occasionally find things that themselves are very evocative of uh, the experiences people have on the property. Uh, what you see here is a handmade die. Um, this is made out of cow bone. Um, it's tiny. It's about three-eighths of an inch on a side. Um, very well may have been made by a prisoner and secreted away. Uh, this was found directly below the floor slabs uh, in the junk cells uh, within there. Uh, this and quite a few other um, small uh, burned pieces of straw uh, lots of things that suggest that the prisoners themselves were while away the time and figuring out uh, how to keep themselves entertained. Uh, we are expecting quite a few more artifacts, not necessarily of this type, but again, those that speak to what the uh, prisoners were doing to fill their time when they weren't actually working. And remember, these people were monitored uh, quite extensively, so the fact that they were able to make these things um, and likely gamble with each other um, also gives you a, another glimpse into life at Open Gate. All right, the micropiling, the image on the left, which I understand is very dark for you to see, uh, what you see there is actually the drilling rig. Um, that was this week. 
Um, many of you have seen more activity on the site. You're going to see a lot more of that in the coming weeks. Uh, these are the pieces of construction equipment coming in. So this is, uh, on the left, that very dark area, is actually the west wall of the guardhouse. And you'll see that drilling rig is just about vertical. And again, if you can see the top and bottom of that wall, you'll see a huge bulge in it. Uh, one of the latest challenges, they're all the way at the southwest corner, the most affected area where we, we most want to get this work done. That wall is so far out of plumb uh, that they can't get the uh, drilling rig aligned properly right now. So we have to go back and do some minor re-engineering uh, to make sure that they can get this system installed uh, where it needs to be. The other thing is, is, again, the reason that we're trying to avoid doing any sort of band-aid repairs on this property again, to kick the can down uh, for the next generation. Uh, to have to deal with where they are drilling is actually through, they're going to be drilling through the concrete that uh, Department of Public Works um, and the Historical Commission poured out there in 1999 and 2000. Um, so that's not a major challenge for this rig to get through, but it's just another example of how we don't want to make these sort of short-term decisions for this property. We want to get to the root of the problem, fix it once, and move on to the next challenge. On the right, you'll see the plan, those micro piles, along with the um, reinforced plates that are actually going to suspend everything you'll see in the corners um, on this property. Those two little squares are the jug cells. Um, many of you do, will recall those are huge floor slabs, um, stone slabs that uh, completely cover the floor of those jug cells. Those in many cases are individually stapled with huge iron uh, rods. Um, a number of those are going to be removed um, in order to make space either for temporary footings as for the um, needle beams that need to be installed in here, and in some cases they're going to be removed to allow some additional archaeological excavation so we get to the materials that we know are going to collapse as soon as we start excavating for the new foundation system itself. So there is progress. Um, we have more. I wanted to give you an idea about the tentative schedule, and I'm underlying tentative because we've had many challenges. Um, we have um, offered suggestions on when we would reopen in the past, and I am um, frankly not uh, going to commit to a date uh, given the complexities that we're already struggling with. In fact, my last, the last thing I want to do is give anybody unreasonable expectations for this. The overall stabilization, the way everything is being scheduled right now, we've had to make adjustments for the winter season, um, is 180 days for the stabilization of the building itself. Um, that includes the reconstruction of the foundation system, everything uh, buttoned up and done. There's going to be some additional time necessary in order to reconstruct that lower retaining wall, um, as well as reforming some of the brick masonry. I'm highlighting this, and this is a matter that we've discussed with a, a number of interested parties here. We are committed to opening at least portions of this property as soon as it is safe to do so. Um, in particular, because of the location of the guardhouse, as soon as we have a stable structure and we can guarantee safe physical access to the mine, it's our intent to open the mine. Um, that's the aspect of the property many people are keenly interested in experiencing, um, and it's the one where we've already done a lot of prep work uh, for reopening. Uh, so we'd like to do that as soon as we can safely do so. All right, beyond the guardhouse. I've, I've talked a lot about this one building, but we have an entire property here that we need to talk about. And when I say that, this is a conversation we need to have about what the future of Old Newgate needs to be. Uh, not just to reflect the interests of the folks here in East Granby and the surrounding towns, but the states and the visitors who come from out of state to experience this property. <laughs> One of the commitments I'm making is that we need to have inclusive partnerships. Um, in the past, there have been lots of disagreements, and in the future, there are going to be disagreements over what should happen on this property. Uh, but we need to be sitting around the table to work this out. Um, so we are really looking forward to starting to gather um, some additional community conversations to not just talk about the physical needs of the property, which has been paramount for us to make sure that everything is still standing uh, 10 years from now, uh, but beyond that, you know, how we interpret this site. Right? Old Newgate, in some ways, is uh, a type of property that engenders a certain amount of laziness because the property itself is so powerful in experience. And we don't want to fall into that trap of letting Old Newgate try to speak for itself. Right. There's a lot of information that we have that needs to be presented to the public in creative ways. Um, and in order to figure out the best way to do that, what we're interpreting and what we're presenting to the public, that needs to be a community conversation. 
The other thing, um, and this is something I want to pick up on uh, that Tammy had mentioned, community events I think are an absolute key component uh, for us going forward. So this isn't just about the um, tremendous historic value of Golden Gate. This is about the property as a community asset. Um, you all have been tremendously interested and supportive of Old Newgate uh, for many years now. And we want to be able to open the doors to allow this place to reflect your own community's interests and events. So the Halloween event is one of those. We really hope to be able to do a soft opening uh, this past fall for that. I'm very keenly interested in making sure we have that opportunity in 2015 to do that. Um, but that's really just the beginning. Um, we have had a number of discussions internally about uh, doing temporary illuminations, other sorts of non-invasive work that really uh, makes a big splash within the community and draws more attention and gets more people out to the property. In particular for the reopening of, uh, of Old New Gate when it's fully opened, we want to make a really big splash and invite everybody back in. Um, we get calls, um, a number of you have mentioned getting calls, uh, and I know a lot of you are interested. Uh, we get calls on this property every week. Um, one of the challenges for us, behind those prison walls, you can't see what's happening. Um, and we recognize that. It's very frustrating. I will also mention it's one of the huge challenges for us. Uh, this property is far and away the most vandalized of any of our agency's properties. Um, we have had at least half a dozen major break-ins uh, in the last year, some of them causing fairly significant damage, uh, people trying to pry through the iron gates, um, smashing windows. Uh, desperately trying to get into those mine shafts. Um, and I think quite a few of you may know this property has some repute as a haunted area. Um, there are ghost hunters and other folks who are keenly interested in getting in there and experiencing the property for themselves. Part of that is frustration because the property has been closed for so long and people have not had easy access to it themselves. So we recognize this is a, uh, this is a situation that in part has to be addressed through public opening. Uh, but it's also a matter of uh, working with the local stakeholders to help us keep an eye on this property. We improve the security systems and try to cut down on the issue, but we have major concerns. As I said, the guardhouse itself is physically unstable. We don't want anyone injured, uh, regardless of the reason that they're in, in there. We do not want people on the property when the building itself is at risk of collapse. Um, so we're really hoping that you stay interested, stay involved, let us know. If you're frustrated, that's fine, let us know. Uh, we need to have this conversation with open forward, and I'm really looking forward to engaging everybody. Um, the spring of this year, I'm targeting May as an opportunity for us to start a series of conversations, whether it's meetings like this um, to start with, uh, whether it's in smaller groups to start figuring out um, interested in individuals who want to have conversations about specific aspects of the property. Um, but we want to have a clear plan, uh, set goals for how we're going to ensure ongoing public access to the property, not just to open it briefly and then have another physical challenge, another preservation issue come uh, where we need to close or another public safety issue, um, but how we have a good long-term plan uh, that everybody understands and we're going to keep it open uh, in the long run. And then again, how do we present the many incredibly interesting stories about this property in a way that is compelling to people? Right. So the prison history is remarkable. The mining history is, awesome, is really awesome here. Um, but also, the insane history of this property as in a public attraction itself um, is filled with curiosity. Um, the menagerie that was kept here, the characters of the people uh, who operated this facility, both in the distant past and in the more recent past, all of this is a really important part, not just of East Granby's history, the property's history, but the state's history and our contributions to national history. Um, so we have a lot to celebrate, and we have to have the confidence to do that um, very proactively and proudly. Uh, finally, I wanted to give some acknowledgments, um, certainly to the elected officials who uh, helped put this together and got the word out uh, to make sure that people were aware of um, for the opportunity to get these updates. I did want to call out Daniel Davis, uh, although you tried to duck the acknowledgment here. I uh, wanted to acknowledge the hard work you put, uh, you put in organizing this event. And then, in particular, I'm, I'm personally going to call out Lance, who's unfortunately not with us tonight. Uh, Lance is perhaps the most dedicated employee that I work with uh, in the state. Um, many of you know him. Uh, he's on that site all the time. He's often alone on that site. Um, he's put his life into uh, keeping that property in the best shape he possibly can. Um, and that needs to be acknowledged publicly as often as possible as well as Karen Peterson, my museum director, who's with us uh, here tonight. 
as well, Karen has been working tirelessly through some very uh, complicated and, and often frustrating circumstances trying to get these uh, projects underway and the reconstruction moving as quickly as possible. So, thank you. Um, and if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Yes? Uh, the yellow house next to the, uh, the, the big house used to be occupied. Yeah. Uh, would occupation of that somehow prevent some of this vandalism that's going on? Yeah, so in, you know, in years past, um, the agency, the Old Connecticut Historical Commission, had actually had two staff members, um, in fact, our director, um, Jack Shanahan, who many of you know, uh, living on the property. Um, so 110, and then the, um, excuse me, 105, 105 my apologies. Uh, 105, and then the bungalow as well. Dave Poirier, who was my predecessor as staff archaeologist, uh, lived in those houses. The best way to preserve buildings is to keep them in active use. Um, so yeah, it's not just monitoring for the vandalism, it's actually keep those buildings in good condition, um, livable uh, condition. We, uh, along with a lot of other state agencies that manage property, uh, had to stop putting our own staff members in there. There were issues with other agencies with the way that they were making those arrangements. Um, and that hampered our own ability uh, to keep these buildings in, in active use. I'm very much interested in having conversations with other community groups that may have interest um, where we can work through uh, lease arrangements where it's appropriate, um, not you know for a substantial fee, but anything that would get people back in those buildings. Uh, to keep the site active and keep it, keep more eyeballs um, on the property itself. Let me just say that um, before that happens, before they moves in, both properties need their own septic system. They don't need code. Neither had central heat. Jack had electric baseboard heat, and Dave Poirier had a propane heater in this living room with ducts. So I don't know if anybody lives in those spaces today. And they also need a well. So before we can, anyone can live there doing anything. They well, they need massive capital improvements. They're all doable, but it needs a big Sure. And I make the point that we have to start thinking in these terms in the long range. Right? So the, the best solution is an active site. Uh, and having programmatic use of these buildings, uh, whether it's associated with Open Gate itself or whether it's another community group that can take advantage of the space that we're not using, uh, those are issues we need to plan for uh, in the long run. Any other questions? I also just wanted to build on something that Dan said. He mentioned how the archaeology is going to give us new information and add to, and how it also uh, documents what the historical records tell us about Newgate. And he he undersold himself. He didn't tell you two stories of the artifacts of two things he showed you. One was that that little fork that he showed. Um, our, we know from the records before they built the prison kitchen, which really was since the 1820s, the food was taken to the prisoners where they worked at the forges in the mail shop and basically thrown at them like they were dogs. And the, a visitor describes this happening in, in 1807. The men would wash the food off in the water that they used at the, the blacksmiths and they'd use the forges to cook their food. So it didn't come with plates and knives and flatware. So what that is that you saw is made from a scrap of nail rod. And to make nails, the prisoners were given pre-made rods, and they cut it off, and then you know formed the head, and made the shank, and made the nail. So somebody took a little scrap, perhaps stole it, and used his skills to create this little two-tongued fork, so we could eat like a civilized human being. So that is very, Dan talks about evocative. You know, you weren't going to find that written in any document, but it ties to what we know about how the prisoner was fed. You saw the dot. We know one prisoner who was there in the 1820s actually published his autobiography. And he talks about frolicking. That's his word. He wrote this in the 1850s. And gambling all night. And so you think, gambling? So here up comes this little tiny dog, so tiny that you could hide it somewhere in a body for this, so that when they did body searches, they couldn't find it. And can't you imagine how angry they must have been in that just so rolling dive to play some gambling game, and the dive goes to the ground. They still want to hit. So, um, so this is, a, and what, 
uh, what we're finding is that when they brought all that loose mine tails that Dan mentioned, they brought with it trash from the prison and then built that guardhouse addition on top. So for us, it's King Tut's tomb. It is a sealed deposit. We know anything we find below that dates from 1819 or before. And that's, so it is, as he says, our best opportunity to find out wonderful new information about the prison, which is why we're so excited about it. And the archaeologists are doing more analysis. They're doing all the final analysis that will be mainly. Did Newgate have dogs? And, you know, because they're finding the bones have been chewed by dogs. And if you look at the Hartford Kern in 1811, where the guards advertised that his dog had wandered off. So you're thinking, this guy has a Catholic family? <laughs> but he did. He advertised. He announced it. Um, you know that and kind of information. Yeah. So it all helps us give nuances so to the Newgate story. Underneath the jug cell, underneath those floor slabs, there are thousands of some of those are. Some of that is just the critters finding in crevices and, and dying a natural death, but in many cases, these are likely broken populations that were active uh, while the property was used. So there are plenty of reasons, and, and you know, as we all know, our society continues to struggle with major issues with crime and punishment and how we deal with the incarcerated. A lot of the themes that still plague us uh, were present from the very earliest days when trying to figure out what to do with people, trying to balance uh, just locking them up versus punishment, versus getting work out of them, versus getting economic benefit out of them, helping them financially support the institution itself. A lot of these things which we think of as very contemporary, um, and they are, they're the same issues that our society has been struggling with for centuries, and there's a lot we can learn um, about our own history from, from these types of, this type of property and this type of work that's on the so we're very excited. Um, we will be getting much more comprehensive reports on the archaeology as those last um, pieces, the excavations on the interior, move forward as part of the stabilization project itself. And so we're certainly hoping to have um, significant new exhibits about the archaeology itself. We have some smaller scale excavations from years past uh, that have only been um, publicly interpreted in very minor ways. Uh, this is another opportunity for us to roll out a lot more information uh, to bring a new dimension to the public's understanding of the property. Yes. Are all the dollars that are required for this project available, been committed, or could we hear six months or a year from now that because of budget restrictions we can't complete this? So the complete construction budget um, is already committed and under contract to do this stabilization work itself. Um, so this funding actually comes out of the Community Investment Act. Uh, that is funded through uh, re uh, filing fee on real estate transactions. Uh, so my agency gets a portion of those dollars. Others go to open space and farm, uh, farmland preservation, as well as affordable housing uh, throughout the state. So uh, that funding has been a substantial portion of the funding available to my agency. has been committed to capital improvements at all four museums. Old Newgate has the largest piece of that. So not just for this uh, project, but looking forward in the future for other necessary improvements and stabilization on the property, that funding is in place. Now, there is no guarantee um, going forward that that funding stays in place, but those those dollars that have already been contracted They're in the lockbox. This project is going forward with the funding we already have in place um, For it so I can give you assurance that the you know The difficult budget issues that we're all going to be struggling with in the, in the coming years They may affect future planning. Um, they will inevitably we all have to face the reality that we, we have to live within our means However, you know, for this work that we're talking about right now, um, that those dollars are already committed, and we're contractually obligated to finish this project. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that that's the case. Thank you. The price tag is 1.4 million dollars. That's what the contract is. So thank yourselves for helping make it possible. Anybody who's done a real estate transaction in the last few years, <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Uh, some of you have got to be awfully curious. <laughs> what else? What are your plans for the matter? 
The tavern, we've actually had quite a few uh, discussions. Uh, Kip Bergstrom, who until quite recently was Deputy Commissioner um, in charge of our programs, had started a process of working with a number of individuals uh, to re-envision what these taverns would be. Um, so there, there are ideas in place, uh, for example, on the, you know, the wider end of the spectrum is to reopen it as a tavern, um, as a public house uh, sort of use. Uh, events uses, as uh, Tammy has mentioned as well, whether uh, weddings or other types of events where the space would be leased out um, on a short-term basis is one of the other discussions that we're having. In the short term, um, as soon as we can get the painting and the minor carpentry repairs done and get the building available, we're going to be opening it to the public so that everybody can see it as it is. It is very impressive, <laughs> um, even in its unrestored state, as a, a very authentic building. Um, it still has some challenges, but uh, it's a large building, um, and it has some spaces that are just crying out um, for some sort of smaller scale events for it. The, the challenge, um, for those of you who travel that road frequently enough, the parking is uh, difficult, and our parking is on the opposite side of the road, and it's not a very safe road to amble across. Um, but those are issues that are surmountable. Uh, for dealing with this. And, and I think that's part of the community discussion we need to have, you know, what, what does East Granby want um, out of Beats Tavern? What is, what is missing? What's the gap within the community that we can fill um, by figuring out what to do with that, um, with that building? Not just as an historic building again, but as another resource for the community at large. Are you going to be doing any archaeological things on the property? The, right now, the work that needs to be done is above ground. Um, so the archaeology we do is really focused on the areas that are going to be disturbed. Um, that's not uh, because we have any lack of interest in doing more, um, but for archaeologists, archaeology itself is inherently destructive. Every time we dig an area, we're physically destroying the record. Um, we're trying to collect as much information as we can, but we need to be very careful about not uh, destroying it to satisfy our own short-term curiosity. Um, so we tend to be very focused in those efforts. There's a lot of archaeology that has yet to be done on that property in general. There is no comprehensive survey of the property. Um, there have been very targeted studies done in the past. Um, but there's still an awful lot about uh, that side of the road that we don't uh, fully know. And in fact, the, the small burial plots there, there's lots of interest um, in taking another look at those as well. Uh, so there's, there are lots of projects um, further off on the horizon that we'd like to do. Uh, for now, we've got to stay focused on getting the property um, back into good condition and open to the public. So we're where there's ground disturbance necessary to do that, we will be doing an archaeology everywhere if there's a potential for something significant to be found. What about protecting the, the tavern? Like that corner that's so exposed to passing bar? They, um, they put in some ballards or something in case. I, you know, and it's an interesting discussion. It's not just that the, the prison wall um, is really terrifying. Um, you know, and I'm sure. Well, I think the prison wall wins. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is. It, it, the house may not it, be so lucky. No, your, your, your point is well taken. The road is extremely narrow. Um, you know, we've had a number of conversations with DOT. It, it is a significant travel route for many people um, here. So uh, slowing down is, is a complicated matter. And um, it, it's, you know, protecting with bollards is one opportunity, but it becomes a safety concern for DOT. Um, I think quite reasonably they don't want to put um, rigid barriers anywhere near the travel lanes where there might, you know, might actually be having a much more catastrophic accident than you would otherwise. And if it's not up close to the building, there's still the opportunity for something like that. Um, but the roadway, um, the modern roadway itself, is really threading a needle between these historic properties. Uh, that's one of one of the other constraints that we, we have to deal with on a regular basis with uh, the old gate. Kind of a quiet crowd. I uh, want to thank Dan and Karen for being here tonight. Um, really appreciate it. It's very informative. Um, if anybody has any questions going forward on, on what's going on in Newgate, don't climb over the wall. Um, just You don't want to get in touch with me. Just give me a call. I can, if, if I don't have the answer, I can probably get it from Dan. Um, but um, we're just looking forward to getting this back open, at least on a, on a partial basis. And uh, really appreciate your time. And thanks, everybody, for coming tonight as well. Thank you.